Hello there. So what's this we hear? The government wants to warn the over 50s off of retiring early. Now, if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe and then like and comment below. Oh, and there's a bit on Harry and Meghan at the end, too. Too many of the over 50s are leaving the workforce, so the government is getting set to issue warnings to them that they can't afford to retire early. The number of those aged 50 to 64 who are now jobless has risen to 3.6 million and 40% of them say they are out of work due to health reasons. And many of these left the workplace during the pandemic and the government is now worried that they don't have enough money to last their lives out. So ministers want to get them back to work or keep them working to ensure they have enough to retire properly on later or that's what they'd have you believe. Since when has any government really had a welfare-based care regarding people retiring early? No, for governments it's always about the arithmetic of tax revenue. And if you are going to keep the youngest and fittest out of the workplace and racking up student debts, or making a 16-hour working week pay for some, then you will eventually need someone else to do the work. And the UK population is fed up with importing ever larger numbers of people to fill job vacancies when so many are unemployed or economically inactive, as they call it. And what exactly is economic inactivity? Some sort of stasis or something? If you are alive and buying food to stay alive, then you are economically active, just possibly not contributing. Anyway, the country supposedly has a labour shortage, so the government wants to get anybody they can back into work and discourage people from retiring early. So the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride is looking into expanding the Midlife MOT, where pension providers, employers and trades unions would offer the over 50s a financial health check. That way they can warn them that they won't have the wherewithal to retire before they take a gamble and hand their notice in. Now many of these people may have been forced out by a combination of redundancy and then ageism preventing them being considered for a new job. Or they realise they do have enough to live on, thank you very much, even if it means scaling back. And the government's own tax rules like IR35, freezing VAT thresholds for the self-employed or whacking those who have large pension pots with punitive taxes if they stay on at work, do not help. And then there's the freezing of income tax thresholds and the like. Putting more tax on work does not make it more attractive. No one ever went to heaven thinking, I wish I'd paid more tax. When you want to stop people doing things like smoking, drinking and driving cars, you tax those activities. So, question for Jeremy Hunt. If you tax work more, what do you think the people who have decided they don't need to work anymore will do? Well, working is not one of them. Oh, and another question. What are those extra half a million people who came here in the year to June doing right now? Are they not filling the gaps? Now, going back a few years, the response to a labour shortage would have been to advertise all the jobs EU-wide and then let those who retired early rot if they later fell on hard times. Now, the government and the employers, who both want people to continue working, are going to have to work hard and be imaginative themselves in how they keep the workplace attractive to people who might be tempted to take early retirement. Lower tax and pay them more, maybe? Now, is that a Brexit freedom's benefit for our workers? And one way is to not tax them into making what can only be viewed as a sensible decision in the face of anti-work Tory policy. Work is good for the economy and should be good for people's finances, so stop taxing it so much. Now there's a surprise. 
The latest survation poll has the Tories starting to close the gap with Labour. According to the pollster, there has been a 10-point swing from Labour to the Conservatives, with Labour dropping five points down to 42% and the Tories going up five points to 31%, reducing the gap to 11%. While the Lib Dems stayed static at 10% and Reform UK stayed at 5%. And this may be a result of the voters not blaming the government for all this industrial action going on. And maybe if Labour shadow ministers and backbenchers are too openly supportive of the strikes, it might cost them support, especially from those who are directly affected. Just shows that politics can be volatile, and a week really is a long time in politics. Now, if further polls start indicating that the Tory ship can still make a turnaround, then you might find the Tory disarray starts fading away. But it's going to take an almighty big change in fortunes to achieve that, and they won't be helped by news that a company linked to Baroness Moan, who recently absented herself from the House of Lords to clear herself of PPE allegations and lost the Tory whip, was somehow able to buy a private jet. And to say people are fuming at all of this is an understatement. Now, you will have probably heard the SNP claiming, time and time again, that Scotland has 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential. Well, although that has been comprehensively debunked, Nicola Sturgeon's SNP are still distributing leaflets making that claim. And according to The Telegraph, it was still on the SNP website yesterday. And now the chairman of the UK Statistics Authority, Sir Robert Choate, has had to intervene to get them to drop the uh, inflated and inaccurate claim. Does that mean Nicola and the SNP have been lying? Especially as more independent research has cited a figure of between 4 and 6%. And now over to Richard, who wants to talk about someone called Harry and someone called Meghan. And yes, he tells me he did watch them on Netflix. Thank you, Jeff, and good evening. OK, you lot. Time to give an honest appraisal to the Harry and Meghan Netflix documentary. It's big news, and as much as I am not a fan of Harry and Meghan or the royal family... It would be rather an engaging, uh, not to uh, cover the first episode at least, if I can stomach it. So I wrote this part before watching Harry and Meghan. And in my usual stream of consciousness style, I want to approach this critique honestly, whilst being very true to how I perceive Harry and Meghan and the royal family. Okay, so I have watched episode one, and... Firstly, from the very off, I am aware of the music that is designed to provoke a heavy emotional response, and the footage is uh, framed very much by the emotional music backdrop, and that does feel very intrusive, and I, I'm, I immediately feel like I'm being manipulated into uh, sympathy for this couple, and that I should feel guilty were I not to warm towards them. So with that in mind, I shall continue to absorb and contextualise this, uh, whatever it is. OK, so one thing really did just stick out. Prince Harry just said that he was late for his first date with Meghan and was sweating in traffic trying to get to her. Hmm, a dig at Prince Andrew, perhaps, the old sweating line. <laughs> one brownie point there, Harry. Also, I'm very aware that... Harry doesn't seem to be the henpecked wimp that he is painted out to be by the, by the media. In fact, he does not seem to be that chap at all. He seems to be his own man. A rather woke man sitting next to a very strong and potentially dominant female. But, hmm, interesting. Not what I was expecting. And, uh, you know what? They really do look like a couple in love. But, then again, is this part of the framing of the documentary? You see, the problem with being pre-programmed into cynicism is when you try and turn off the cynicism, it doesn't work. It just makes you more cynical. Right now, I am cynical of the media and how they have portrayed this couple, 
but also I am very cynical of Megan, who still has an air of the manipulative narcissist about her. And let's not forget she is an actress, yet some things cannot be acted. If some of her displays in this episode are acting, then she is the greatest actress of her generation, uh, which she isn't. Look, I said I was going to be honest, regardless of my own preconceived ideas of these two people. So, are they after money? Well, it, probably yes. Are they after attention? Um, yes. Are they throwing the royal family under the bus? Yes. Do I care about that? No. Throw away. But there is more to them than we, we have been told by the media. And they do have a right to express their side, and wrongs if they are wrong, and... But I, I'm still questioning their motives. Sorry, I am. What I want to know is, are these two people genuine? Or do I really want to know? Do I actually care that much? Hmm. Look, I am not a fan of their hideous woke agenda and self-promotion, and I am still very dubious about their motivations, but something feels off here in the way they have been portrayed by the media to what appears to be honest footage that is a far cry from the media's portrayal of them. Because they do seem to be a couple very much in love, and no, I don't think she is good enough an actress to fake the subtle intricacies of their interactions. And also they seem imperfect as a couple too, which I wasn't expecting. Hmm. But how sorry do I feel for them in the sense of their troubles? I feel no sympathy at all. Well, maybe a little bit, you know, I'm only human. But they are overprivileged and playing on their names. But then again, in their position, who wouldn't? If you were raised as a, a spare in front of the flashing lights, how would you carve your path? You can't blame the lad for wanting to carve his own path in life, and, and why should he be expected to follow a life of service and have any loyalty to an institution like the royal family and the media that have exploited him since birth? But Harry won't be worrying about paying the bills this Christmas, or the heating, or if his children will get a prezi from Santa. No, but I don't hate them. I don't hate them like I am being told I should, and I am feeling very weary towards those that tell me I should hate them. Harry drawing comparisons between Meghan and his late mother has stirred up some people in a... They're going absolutely crazy. You know, some people say, how, how utterly preposterous to even think the narcissist that is Meghan Markle could ever be compared to our Diana. And to those people, I feel quite annoyed because that's how Harry perceives the love he feels for Meghan. And nobody has the right to tell him he is wrong. I mean, the whole thing could be staged. But hey, if it is, it is. Is it really such a big deal to, for him to say how he feels, even if he doesn't feel that way? And let's not forget, for a good few years, Diana was painted as mad and bad by the very same media who flocked around to... Well, they just, they just ran to Prince Charles' side, didn't they, as soon as the, that couple split up? But I don't care, really. Why am I doing this video? Anyway, as much as I love the commentary on GB News from the likes of Dan Wooten, I feel at odds with his vitriol and that of other guests against these two people because they have the right to say and feel whatever they want to, regardless of the damage it is doing to the royal family, etc. If, if Prince Harry wants to trash his own family, then just go ahead. Let's not forget this very same family recently left someone out in the cold for the wolves, just for making a, a, a racist comment that wasn't a racist comment? Uh. Where were Charles and William for her when she had stuck by, well, stuck by Charles's mother? for so many years. They were just bowing down to the, the woke police like everyone else. The last three years have reinforced a point of view that I have held for a long time, and that is I don't trust the media when it comes to anything. So why shall I trust the narrative they give over Harry and Meghan? I'm not saying I'm a fans of theirs at all, but they are not the monsters they are made out to be in the press at the moment. And is this documentary that awful? Far from it, but they are just people. And if you don't like them, don't watch them. I don't like soap operas, so guess what? I don't watch them. But it's hard not to warm to Harry again because the documentary reminds you of things he did in his teens and in his early 20s and how he did try to help as many people as he could. But nonetheless, when it comes to doing his bit, his heart was always in the right place. So context of Harry is necessary. 
but don't get swept away. Remember, he was lucky enough to be in a position in life to make an impact, as others try to, so, well, so much harder than him, yet get no media coverage for their selfless efforts. Anyway, that's the first episode of Harry and Meghan for you, and I am sure I will, I'm not sure if I will watch any more of them. I might. But like you, it's my choice to watch or not to watch what I want to watch. And like you, I have a right to an opinion that may be at odds with yours. And you might be completely furious with what I've had to say. Well, that's fine. That's good. It's called a free country. My conclusion is that my conclusion is this. They are not worthy of excessive praise, but they're certainly not deserving of hate. They are too transparent for either. I am told in other episodes they make fun of curtsy, curtsy, what it called, curtsying and whatever it is in front of the late queen and say and saying that Brexit was racist. Ah, blah blah blah. I just don't care. But I still won't hate them. I find it very odd that the press that tells us to hate this couple whilst remaining silent when it comes to those that have imprisoned us and poisoned us with you know what over the past two years. No, no hatred there from the press. Anyway, wrap up warm, you lot. It's getting cold outside, so check on your elderly neighbours too. They might need your help. Back over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Richard. And finally, when subscribing, please don't forget to press that little bell and also select the all option or you won't get any notifications when I publish a new video. And thank you all so much for taking the time to watch the show.